Next is you really need to have a very clear path of what your plan of action is going to be. And this is a step-by-step -step process. You have to understand what your step-by-step -step process is going to be. What do you already have? What do you still need? Um, and how are you going to keep making little chunks to keep walking forward? I think for a lot of um, Serenity hopefuls is they have this big, long laundry list, right, of things. And there's like they get kind of frozen in that because it's so overwhelming to look at the big picture. They have a hard time kind of taking it in little tiny chunks. Um, so, again, we help our students take the smaller chunks, makes the journey seem more achievable. And you start getting those quick wins and making some progress. And it just becomes an overall you keep moving in the right direction versus staying stagnant. Guaranteed Serenade School acceptance. Sounds too good to be true, or is it? So something exciting that is right around the corner is that Serenade School Prep Academy is now going to be able to guarantee your acceptance into Serenade School into any school across the country. In today's episode, I'm gonna actually share you the framework that we have built that will guarantee your acceptance in the CRNA school. If you're interested in learning more about our CRNA guarantee program, we do have a link down below that you can learn more. Um, it is an application only type of program and we do only have 26 seats. So if you're interested, be sure to pause this episode and click the link below to learn more. If you're already a CSBA student, you get first dibs um, again, our cohorts are only going to be uh, 26 students. And as a current Serenade School Prep Academy member, you will get first priority to take place or take part in this next cohort. So um, be on lookout for your email. Otherwise, the official dates for the Serenade Guarantee Program um, applications will open on January 9th. And the actual cohort will start on January 16th. So it is going to be a pretty quick selection process. Um, but I hope to see you guys apply to this. So without further ado, let's get into the framework that is going to guarantee your CRNA acceptance. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to CRNA School Prep Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Fennell. And today we're going to share with you the framework behind our CRNA guarantee program. So this is really exciting. I'm so thrilled to be able to launch this program. It has been um, in the making for quite some time. And I'm just honored to be a part of your CRNA journey. Of course, all of you, every single one of you, um, I'm speaking to you. I'm honored to be a part of your journey. Thank you so very much for tuning into the podcast. I want to let you, all the listeners know that I appreciate you. Um, and whether or not you're a member of CSBA or not, I appreciate you tuning in and being a valued member of our community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the CRNA guarantee program is really exciting. And again, I announced it before this episode, if you want more information to go below and, um, learn more. Um, but without further ado, um, how does this work? How do you guarantee your CRNA school acceptance? Well, over the last three years that we have been running CRNA school prep Academy, we have found kind of the golden path of students who find the most success typically do certain things. Um, and so we have essentially taken that framework and we have outlined um, a curriculum that uh, we fully believe in that if it is done um, and completed that you will get into CRNA school. So, so much so that it comes with a money back guarantee. Uh, really the way this framework kind of starts and um, how I believe all of you should start your CRNA journey is kind of by seeking out like ideas and um, kind of really just putting your, your feelers out there as far as what the career path of a CRNA really entails, right? One of the first steps, in my opinion, to becoming a CRNA is you have to understand what that means, right? What does this career path really look like and understand it in a sense that how would you fit into this career path. So one of the first frameworks is kind of understanding what is your why? Why do you want to become a CRNA? Why is it? Why are you passionate about it? Um, and, and it has to be an emotional why. If it's not emotional, it's not your why. Um, I will tell you that right now. A true drive to push you towards success is something that will spur emotions within you. So that is really the kind of the foundation that you need to start with when um, starting your CRNA journey. 
Um, you also equally need to understand what it is that you can bring to the table as a candidate, right? So what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And how does that play out into your role as a nurse and as a CRNA and as an applicant? It's understanding how to pick your school and knowing that it's a two-way street, okay? So it goes from kind of understanding what you bring to the table as an applicant and how you can best stand out from your competition. That's kind of number one and knowing your why. Number, you know, steps two through, I, I love to say two through 10 would be easy if it was 10 steps, but essentially the next step after the first step is essentially picking your school and not just picking the school that's down the road, understanding why you are picking that school and getting to know that school. And there's a lot that kind of goes into this more than just the surface level. I think it sounds pretty surface level, but it's actually very, um, a very intimate experience when you truly get to know your school. And um, that is something that we teach our students how to do and kind of the right questions to ask and how to go about finding out this information that is sometimes hard to dig through and find on the internet. But it's, it's picking the right school for you and not you know, just a CRNA school. Why is it the right school for you? You have to understand why it's the right fit. Um, Cause remember it's a two way street. They're picking you, but you're equally picking them. So there's a lot of different things you again have to think about other than just cost and location when picking a CRNA program. Um, the other next, next step I should say in the framework is understanding kind of the strengths and weaknesses of your selections. And really kind of the best way to do this is touching base with a current student from your program um, and asking kind of hard questions and, and understanding what the strengths again and weaknesses are of each individual choice and how that plays out in your own uh, in your own journey to become a CRNA. Because I'll tell you right now that someone's you know, t number one school is equally someone else's number third school, right? So what makes it my number one and your number three? That's the differences that you need to be able to hone in on and understand as you're preparing your applications and really well before that. I mean, this should really occur well before you're even thinking about applying to CRNA school. You should really understand these things. Um, next um, in the framework really is beefing up your ICU experience in a sense that, you know, you don't need all the units. Um, you know, you don't need CVICU. <laughs> if you have PICU, you're going to be okay, right? So there's all these little nuances around ICU experience, but you may have PICU experience and you may not be okay. You, you know, maybe your school does have a preference for CVICU. I, you know, those are, these are the little things that if you find out by going to things like open houses and connecting with your programs, you're going to be better off, right? So it's assessing your ICU experience and knowing whether you're in a good place or not and not being afraid of making that big change, right? Probably one of the most painful things that I have to see students go through other than taking things like the GRE and, you know, all these extra tests um, is making an ICU change because sometimes you really like your ICU, but it's not the right ICU or it's not an ICU at all. Um, or maybe you think you need to be well-rounded and go to them all. Um, which is just really not true. I'm not saying that having different ICU experience is bad, but if it hinders you from getting the sickest of the sickest patients, it may not be the best either, right? Because typically when you're starting off in a brand new ICU, you're kind of at the bottom of the barrel as far as experience goes. And so you're not going to be taking the sickest of the sickest patients. You're not going to be doing charge and precepting because you're the new kid on the block. So ICU hopping is not necessarily the best way to get to become a well-rounded uh, candidate, right? So again, it's assessing your ICU experience and what that means for your schools and for you. Um, don't pick a unit because you think it's what schools want. If you're going to be miserable, go to a unit that's going to nurture and support you and give you the most opportunity for growth. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a sick you, a burn unit or whatever it is, as long as it's high acuity ICU. Again, assessing this early on is really, really critical in your CRNA path. So again, we... we are the framework coaches our students on this topic um, pretty thoroughly. Um, next is you really need to have a very clear path of what your plan of action is going to be. And this is a step-by-step -step process. You have to understand what your step-by-step -step process is going to be. What do you already have? What do you still need? Um, and how are you going to keep making little chunks to keep walking forward? I think for a lot of um Serenity hopefuls is they have this big long laundry list, right, of things, and they're just like they get kind of frozen in that because it's so overwhelming to look at the big picture. 
they have a hard time kind of taking it in little tiny chunks. Um, so again, we help our students take the smaller chunks, makes the journey seem more achievable, and you start getting those quick wins and making some progress, and it just becomes an overall, you keep moving in the right direction versus staying stagnant. Um, the next thing in the framework really is kind of, um, you know, kind of understanding what your own obstacles are, right? And there's, there are about five obstacles that I typically students see students make. And again, we teach this in our framework. Um, it would be too long for me to go over all the obstacles today, but, you know, kind of knowing what your elephant in the room is, you know, so for some students, it may be GPA. For some students, it may be their age or for some students, it may be their family. I mean, whatever it is, whatever you foresee your barrier to be, you have to understand how you're going to get through that, how you're going to knock that perceived barrier on its flat, right? So you can walk over it. And this, again, can be kind of a pretty big hindrance for some applicants who are otherwise incredibly great candidates. They just can't get over this like obstacle that they feel is going to hold them back or going to hinder them or going to hurt them or going to make them fail or flunk out or whatever it is. Um, sometimes it's imposter syndrome, right? So you have to address whatever obstacle you foresee potentially being in your way that even could be a mental roadblock block. It doesn't have to be something physical or something that actually happened. It could be a mental roadblock. So it's dealing with uh, the five obstacles that I call it uh, when it comes to kind of seeking out your own CRNA journey. Um, the next thing that I think really kind of we teach in our framework that I think really makes a big difference is not just understanding the ICU experience that you need to have, but how to best utilize the ICU experience so that you actually become a very strong ICU nurse. And while I know time can play in your favor, equally time can play against you in this. And I know that might sound kind of counterintuitive, but just because you've been an ICU nurse for 15 plus 20 years doesn't mean you're teed up for CRNA school, okay? Because sometimes, unfortunately, what can happen over time is you can develop bad habits, right? or good habits. You can go either way. And so really the key with your ICU experience is understanding how to develop the good habits um, that will actually help you flourish as, uh, as, as an applicant, as a CRNA, and as an SRNA once you're in school. So it's kind of understanding what are some key things you need to be doing while you're actually in the ICU and how can you best utilize that time? What does it look like to be at the top of your game as an ICU nurse? Um, and so really understanding that aspect of the pre-CRNA path. Um, next in the framework is really kind of shifting focus a little bit and really looking in on you. <laughs> yeah. On you as an applicant and really starting putting those puzzle pieces together, right. And start really making things like your resume, um, and teeing it up and making sure it's exactly, and that's really legible, that it's flows nice that everything's accurate, um, that you use just good descriptive words, um, you know, so it's really kind of starting to get the foundations of your application ready um, and knowing what are some things that these schools would love to see highlighted, right? Um, I can't tell you how many times I had run across, I've run across candidates who, you know, when I meet them and I talk to them, I'm blown away by what they tell me, their stories and, you know, their passions and their whys and why they got certain awards and whatever it may be. But I didn't gather any of that from their resume or it was very like, it, just, it didn't do them any any favors, right? So I'm I, I you really your resume and even your essay can really go a long long way when it comes to highlighting you. And think about this, um, think about like a wedding invitation, right? I mean, I, I don't know why I always go to that because something my mom said to me always kind of stuck with me when we were getting married. Cause I I wanted to do like the uh, I think it's called send in stamps or I don't even know. I just remember it was cheap and it was easy. And I'm like I'm just gonna send out like like whatever's cheap, you know, for a wedding invitation, people just throw them in the garbage, right? That's kind of what I said. And my mom was like, you will absolutely not do that because that's people's first impression of the type of wedding you're going to hold. And I'm like, huh, I hadn't really thought of it like that. But if you think about like your resume and essay, it's really your making, that's like your first impression because these programs may not have actually met you in person. Although I hope that they have, because if you equally take the advice of going to program open houses and different events and things like that, you're going to have a chance to meet these program faculty. But that being said, your resume and essay are really one of the first things in your application that's going to help you stand out amongst the crowd. So you have to take them 
seriously and you and not that you wouldn't, but you have to make sure that you're doing five, six, seven, eight revisions of your essay, right? Not just, oh, three times and I'm done. No, it may need a lot more than that. You may need to have another set of eyes. Um, same thing with your resume. So again, we, we, the framework that we teach, you know, the resume building, um, you know, essentially how to write a good personal statement. Um, and then the next thing that we do is that we really start trying to make sure that your transcripts and your GPA is all teed up because that's a really big, important thing. And so we, um, again, I'm going to teach you how to, how to kind of look over your own transcripts, um, and make sure that there's no loopholes. Another thing is you have to equally make sure that your uh, if you have any prerequisites or any preferences, right? They might they may not even be prereqs, good, but you have to really thoroughly thoroughly examine your transcripts in relation to what the school is expecting to see from your undergrad degree. Not all nursing schools even have you take a real chemistry course, is what these schools will say. Um, it might be intro to chemistry. Well, that might not count to fulfill their chemistry requirements. Um, or maybe you only have intro to chemistry and chem one, but they require chem one and chem two, right? So you have to really thoroughly look at your transcripts and understand what the school requirements are. There's so many qualified applicants who get put in the unqualified pile because of this very thing alone. Um, so this is something that I think most candidates kind of potentially even overlook. Uh, we had someone who tested out of a math course for another example, in high school, like he had tested out of high college math. So college math was required for this CRNA program, but he assumed, assumed, this is, a, you never want to assume, <laughs> like that's just bad news, that since he tested out, that he equally tested out for CRNA school, and that's just not the case. So he was put in a non-qualified pile. Um, now this person went on to get other interviews and accepted, however, not the school that, um, that he originally applied to because of that very reason. So but he didn't know that until it was too late. Nothing, nothing they can do. But that alone, if you knew that, and let's just say you're like, well, I don't want to take a math course at this point. I don't have time to take a math course. Well, then you just don't apply to that school and you save that application fee for another school. So um, it just allows you to be smarter and, and work more efficiently on your application so that you give yourself the best chance, right? And again, our, you know, our whole framework is to guarantee your acceptance. So that's why we look at all these little you know, you look at the, all this under a microscope. Okay. Cause we want to really thoroughly analyze what's going on. And the next step in our framework, uh, that we kind of unravel is the fact that we want to help your emotional intelligence such that you can be confident, but yet display that you're a learner. And we equally want you to be able to navigate difficult personalities, not just in the interview, but as you embark on your journey to become a CRNA. And so, Another aspect of the framework that we're going to do pretty exclusively inside of the guarantee program is we're going to work with um, emotional intelligence coaching through clinical scenarios and things of that nature to really help you start thinking through what things sound like and look like because it's so easy, you guys, and I'm guilty, 100% guilty. Like no one's born having all the emotional intelligence. <laughs> I still put my foot in my mouth all the time and I'm like, oh, darn it. You know, I can be awkward. I get it. Like sometimes I'm like, I don't know if I thought that through before I said it. So, but that's just it. Once you recognize when you have moments like these, that is exactly what you need to work on it, to improve, to do better. And the only way you can do that is to be cognizant and aware of, of who you are and how you react to the world around you. So emotional intelligence is really huge. Programs are also really heavily focusing on this because they're realizing that it Emotional intelligence alone, for the most part, can really make or break a cohort. Um, you know, a lot of programs will say, you know, as long as you're teachable, I can teach you all of the science stuff, you know, but the emotional intelligence, it takes time. It takes time to build that. It doesn't happen overnight the way that teaching pathophysiology does. So these programs know that students have to have somewhat of a base of emotional intelligence prior to entering because it's, it's more of a slow, insidious process of teaching emotional intelligence it can and will develop, but during your time in CRNA school, if you start with a good foundation, you, programs know automatically that you're going to do better and be more successful in school. Um, so that's kind of the next thing. Now we're moving on to another really big heavy hitter, which is preparing for the interview. So we're also uniquely going to be doing um, group mock interviews and one-on-one -on -one mock interviews in this um, CRNA guarantee pathway because I can't stress enough how important the interview is. I mean, if you get an interview, like getting the interview is half the battle, right? 
then you have to excel in the interview. And the interview can be really hard. I mean, nerves play into it. Um, you know, whether or not you got any sleep or, or could sleep, that is. Um, and, and just, it's just the stress, right? And something about practicing and under, and putting yourself intentionally in these high stress situations through things like mock interviews is really, really critical for you to kind of get your jitters out and for you to practice and critique. And like I said before, for the emotional intelligence, the only way to improve your interview skills is to do them and critique yourself, review them and try again. Um, it's that awareness piece, right? It's the awareness of, oh, I was clicking my pen. I didn't even know I was doing it. Maybe next time I'll, I won't even bring the pen with me or I'll bring a non-clickable pen, right? Um, or maybe I was sitting there playing with my necklace. I maybe I don't, I shouldn't wear a necklace. And so it's, again, critiquing yourself by reviewing the material and reviewing the feedback and knowing how to take the feedback in a way that, you know, maybe it does kind of hurt to hear some of the things. And maybe you do feel kind of bummed out about how you performed or didn't perform or whatever it is. But you guys, so many students that I personally have mock interviewed who did pretty poorly that took the feedback that I gave them turned around and made a successful interview out of it, okay? It, it's it's just a matter of being open to it. Um, now, I could say most of the people took it that way, right? Most people took it really well. I can only recall one person that I don't think took the feedback very well um, and was very closed off to it. And they ended up giving up on their CRNA pursuit. And so it just goes to show that, you know, if you're open to growing as a person, and that means looking at where your weaknesses are and doing something about them, then you're going to be successful in the pursuit of CRNA. It may not be easy. It may be a lot of work. It may stink. It may hurt. It may just outright suck. <laughs> but it's the fact that you're willing to deal with that, right? Um, and, and, and do things that you don't want to do. That's called discipline. So again, we heavily work on the preparedness of the applicant through the application process and the interview process. The interview process <laughs> starts from day one. And I think this is where a lot of people go wrong is they wait till they get asked to interview to start preparing or they wait till they submit their application to start preparing. And really at that point, you've kind of missed a little bit of potential really great space for you to start preparing. Um, and so Again, this 12 month program very early on, we're doing things like preparing for the interview and it seems crazy, but I, I know it's what you need to be successful. So again, part of the framework is outlining the types of information, types of uh, courses and information you need to know and kind of making it very clear. And then also understanding what interview style that you're up against. You could have three different styles of interviews if you're going to three different schools or maybe you're interviewing at six schools, maybe out of those six schools, Two of them are very different interviews and maybe four of them are relatively similar, right? But knowing that ahead of time and not focusing on the type of question, on the actual question, but the type of question is really, really key in helping you prepare. And really, I always say this, even though I don't know how people actually listen to me, but you really need to be, even if you think it's only EQ or personality type questions, um, you need to be well prepared for anything that could throw your way. Because um, really, you never know. Um, these schools know candidates talk and, you know, they may just have, maybe they just get an itch, right? Maybe there's an itch that they want to ask you something that's a little bit clinical, right? Maybe because something on your resume really stood out and they're like, I, got, I have to ask about that. Even though typically from there, we're going to ask all personality questions. So it's just, it's good to be prepared. I'm not saying you have to go on a giant rabbit hole and, and dive real heavy, but doing things like studying for your CCRN or your CMC, CSC, whatever certification that you're working on is also equally a really great way to prepare for your interview on top of equally hitting, you know, emotional intelligence type kind of questions and things like that. Um, and then really kind of from there, there's some outlier things with the interview. Like, do they do like a on the spot essay or a Casper's test or a math test or a CCRN style test? I mean, again, this is where this, the school interview can kind of be nice to know so you can do your best to prepare. If you knew you were going to have anesthesia math, you're going to practice, right? Um, so kind of having that little bit of a heads up kind of scenario is really, really crucial. And it's funny because I just talked to another student who goes to the program I went to. And, you know, they even said, you know, I reached out to the director prior to applying. And he told me what I need to know for the interview. He outlined an entire list. And again, it's for a lot of schools, you guys, it's no secret 
Some schools do keep it secret. However, some schools have like a non-disclosure kind of agreement. Um, but many of them will tell you. We'll just be a pretty uh, straight up. This is how we interview. This is the kind of style. This is the kind of questions we ask. You know, but then it's up to you to do the homework, right? It's up to you to then to do the work to do well during that style of interview. So kind of the director that gives all this study guides and things like that, kind of his rationale is like, well, if they show up and they're really prepared, I know that they take initiative. I know that they'll do the work and they'll be similar in CRNA school. So it's kind of like a test, actually, <laughs> um, if you think of that way. Uh, so again, knowing this ahead of time, but the students who don't reach out, who don't know, who walk into a blind, they're going to be unprepared for the most part, especially compared to the candidates who did know. Um, and so I don't know, it just it gives you a little bit of extra, extra edge. The next piece of framework, other than just really hitting home on the interview practice, and both individually and in a group setting, I think a lot of people are so turned off by a group setting because they're nervous or they're scared. But you guys, that's exactly what we want you to be, because that's exactly how you're going to be when you're actually in the interview. <laughs> you're going to be nervous. You're going to feel embarrassed. You're going to be shy. So don't shy away from group interviews because those can be really valuable. Not to mention, be a fly on the wall and listen to what people say. And then the critique, it's only going to help you. I've had so many students of Steering School Prep Academy tell me, Jenny, I love your mock interview library. Can you please do more? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm glad you love it. We have a lot in there already. Um, and we have at least, I don't know, six group mock interview recordings plus an additional six actual one-on-one -on -one mock interviews. So we have over 12 hours, maybe I think some of the group mock interviews are two hours long. So there's like 20 some hours of, you know, mock interview prep, just review and, and replays and, and actually more than that because we do Q and A's and everything else. But that's a huge part of your practice is just being a sponge and looking at how others did and, and critiquing them too and saying, okay, well, I don't, I like how they did this. I don't like how they did this. And so this is how I'm going to do what I want to do. Right. So it's just, it's using all the tools in your toolbox. And really kind of the last piece of this framework is, you know, kind of a couple different things. One of them is how do you move forward if you get a wait list or how do you move forward if you get a rejection? Um, you know, what are the next steps from there? And while, you know, I, if you do all the things in the framework, which there's a lot, I know I sound like I breeze through it, but within each one of those categories, there's actually quite a few things to do. Um, there's like, like networking piece, you know, and doing and getting and connecting with schools, you know, there's a certain method to that, that I think if students follow, they're going to find more success just for the fact that they can make a contact and get good advice from that contact. Right. But all that being said, you know, I think, you know, as a community, it's important for us to stick together. It's important for us to help one another. It's important for us to support our peers when they're down. You know, if you get a wait list, sometimes that can feel like a big blow to the stomach. Like, oh, I'm good enough, but I'm not good enough. Right. Or an almost yes, <laughs> you know, and it's kind of like, no, I'm so close. Just let me in. But, you know, I think a lot of candidates don't know what to do. Like, you know, they don't know how, what are the next steps. And many students get off the wait list. And a wait list, in my opinion, is a yes. Um, I know it doesn't seem like that until you after you get off of the wait list. But it's them saying, hey, we really like you. We would take you if we had more seats. That's what a wait list is. You know, so but how do you make it so they think of you as soon as that spot opens up on the wait list? Most schools will not tell you the number that you're on the wait list. Some schools don't even number a wait list, but some schools do and they won't tell you. Um, I don't think I've ever heard of a school that tells you, but maybe there is one out there. But I would say for the most part, it remains anonymous. But if you don't, don't remain stagnant. Don't, don't be still. There are still plenty you can do if you get waitlisted. So that kind of rounds up the framework of how to be successful um, at getting a CRNA school, a CRNA guarantee. Um, you know, but again, I think, again, I feel like I, I hope I didn't oversimplify <laughs> um, what all you need to do. I hope this kind of painted a pretty, pretty picture for you. And there's a lot of little steps. And I think the unique part about it is kind of figuring out what steps you need to take and not worry about what your coworkers doing because they're different and you're different and you should be proud of that. And you should own your own path and your own experience and your own uh, knowledge and expertise and kind of figure out, you know, how, what strengths do you have and what are you bringing to the table? Um, and, and, you know, timeline wise, you know, just do you do what feels good to you. You know, I, I, you know, 
while I'm all for getting ICU experience, don't get me wrong, but I equally don't think anyone should tell you that you should have to spend at minimum three years in ICU. If your school requires a year and that is your timeline and that is what you want to do, make the most of it and go and go to CNA school. I mean, one of my, my good friends and dear colleague and an amazing CRNA, she's so good. She, she's head of the block team where she works and she teaches blocks like she knows it like the back of her hand. Um, she only has six months of ICU experience when she applied. She had a year by the time she started the program. She's an excellent CRNA. She's so stinking smart. So, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that's the right thing for every person in every situation. Equally said, if you've been an ICU nurse for 20 years, don't think that you're too late to the game. If this is your time, go. You know, I've had a lot of students who say, you know, I, I just had to wait till my kids were, were out of the house. And now I have the freedom that I, I can, I can go to CRNA school. Then that's amazing. Do it. Don't hesitate. Don't stop. If that was your thought all along, then listen to that. You know, whether you want to have kids or you're planning kids, like I, you know, it's, it's so hard to ever find the right time in life to do anything, right? Sometimes the kind of what you just have to do is just do it and, and figure it out. And I'm not, saying you should all go into steering school and try to all have babies. But if it happens, it happens. Make sure you have the support system and make sure you know what your priority is, which is bu buckling down and getting through school, right? Um, obviously, and snuggling that little precious baby. But I'm just saying, make sure you have the support system so your priority, which is steering school, can be maintained. Um, it's going to be hard. It's going to be incredibly difficult, but it can be done. Um, many of my colleagues um, that I worked with as CRNAs, one of them in particular that I remember, she had her baby. It was not planned, but she had her baby like the last few semester, last few months of CRNA school. And so she pretty much, I mean, I don't think she took more than like a couple weeks off, came back to clinical after a C-section nonetheless. I don't, yeah. And made sure she didn't get behind on her clinical hours, right? So she could still pass boards or sit for boards. And she cried. She cried a lot. I, in fact, I went with her in the locker room quite often <laughs> And because she came back to her open heart rotation, nonetheless, like, can you imagine? I can't even imagine. Like, I felt so bad for her. Um, she did. She did a great job considering how much stress and like no sleep she was under. But, you know, she it's funny. She went on to be a CRNA and worked at this hospital. And she, she I heard her say one time where she was like, I don't know how I did it. I don't know how I did it, but I did. And I survived. And it was incredibly freaking hard. Um, but she, you know, she can laugh about it, you know, probably <laughs> laugh with some tears, <laughs> So, <laughs> but she did it right. So, you know, I think just be realistic with, um, with what you have going on. I've equally had students who need to take time off for their health. Maybe something big's going on. It's okay. Don't be afraid. Don't go at it alone. And even when you're applying to CNA school, be open with these programs about what's going on in your life. If you need, you know, candidates who get accepted sometimes have to take a deferral, right? Because they have to focus on their health or their family or whatever is going on in your life. It's okay um, to at least ask the question if you can take a deferral for the following year. I don't know what made me get into that topic on this episode. <laughs> I guess it's just because, you know, I see so many people kind of hesitate to even get started on this journey because they're so fearful of the what ifs. Um, but the what ifs are just the what ifs. You're like, they're not you don't like you can't not take action for something that has not even happened or is not currently happening. Like you just have to go and deal with the what ifs as they come, if they come. Um, so I guess I wanted to kind of push those of you who are kind of on the ledge of should I take this massive feat and do this? Maybe you've been tuning for a while and you're like, ah, ah, well, this is your time. This is your calling. CRNA guarantee program. We're going to guarantee your acceptance. Like, now or never, get in, get in while it's hot. So again, the link below, if you want to learn more about applying to the CRNA guarantee, I hope to see you there. And I look forward to celebrating your CRNA success. Thank you so much for tuning in today's show. As always, I appreciate you guys. I would really, really appreciate if you left the podcast a review. Hey, future CRNA, as always, I appreciate you and your loyalty. Thank you so very much for tuning in this week. I'd love to hear from you, so screenshot this episode and share it to your IG stories with your biggest takeaway. Don't forget to tag me at CRNA School Prep Academy so I can personally thank you. Be sure to head over to CRNAschoolPrepAcademy.com to check out our blog 
and gather free resources to help you along your CRNA journey. Stay strong and I'll see you next week.